hacksters it is my favorite day of the week we've got a couple of awesome people here to talk about hardware and it is noiries and liz clark from adafruit hello how's it going hey hello we're hanging out thanks for having us my pleasure and you've both been on the sh on the show before but you hit me up because you have a new project yes want to tell us about it sure uh so recently we collaborated on a project it is adafruit's mascot Adabot, you might have seen Adabot on different forms of content. And recently, uh, Lamore Free, Lady Ada, she came out with a new dev board. It's the uh, RP2040 prop maker feather. And it's an RP2040 feather with all the usual bells and whistles, but it has some extra functionality. It has a built-in LAS3DH accelerometer, has a header for a servo. Uh, it has terminal block for NeoPixel, it has five volts, so you're getting fully powered. Um, has a pin for an external button or just an additional digital input or output. And then it also has an I2S amp on board. So it has speaker output on here as well. So basically we used to take like a couple of extra boards plus a feather. Now it's just in like this one little form factor. And that's what's powering this Adabot. Yeah. Yes. So I took it on myself to be like, hey, let's, because Lamar is like, let's redo the lightsaber projects, maybe a ray gun. And I was like, you know what? The Adabot is something we haven't 3D printed in a long time. It's been like eight years or so. Wow. And it, yeah, right. So I figured let's actually make Adabot move, yes. speak a little bit, and have a little bit of like motion activated stuff to it. Uh, so uh, I designed the guy in, th in Fusion 360. And we got a couple things. We got a button on the back and the slide switch I will activate now. Let's see what happens. So uh, it's got a little servo, the, the kind of standard micro servo, uh, just a little LiPo battery, uh, the button, when I hit the button. Uh-oh, uh -oh, I think I did something wrong. No. <laughs> so uh, if, if you've seen any of Adafruit's um, The Puppet Show, Circuit mm -hmm. Playground, um, I went through a couple of the episodes and sampled uh, some of the various phrases uh, from the show. Hello, world. That's a very, very good one. Those are amazing. Yeah, so I just thought I'd, I'd take... Did you hear something? Did you hear something? Yes, I did. <laughs> so if you don't know Adabot, Adabot's like, it was conceived by Philip Tyrone, Mr. Lady Ada, and it was designed by Bruce Yan, who's our creative director on Adafruit. And they just kind of wanted to create like the Elmo of electronics. So it's like this puppet. Uh, it, it's kind of not super knowledgeable. So throughout the shows, they, they cover different like basics of electronics amperage, batteries, et cetera. They tried to kind of do the A through Z of electronics. So it's Adafruit's mascot. It's in a couple of different uh, promo graphics and things. Uh, but, you know, we, we 3D printed, we designed and 3D printed it like a couple years ago now. I think it was like 2015, but we didn't actually make it move. And it, back then it would have been kind of hard because we would have needed a lot of electronics. So with the the new prop maker feather, it was it was so much easier to actually stuff it with yeah. <laughs> all the wires and stuff because it, it even though it's really simple it's got one servo it's got a speaker in the head it's got the slide switch in the button uh even still like there's there's a lot of wires in there um but because of the screw block terminals it's really easy to kind of put it together now yeah and the code is circuit python um so it's really easy to do audio projects circuit python because you can just drag and drop the files um wave files directly onto the board since it shows up as um like a flash drive basically uh and then there's um a lot of functionality like um, the mixer that lets you control volume and whether it's playing or paused um so it, it just makes it really simple to um code up something like this whereas in the past it'd be kind of complicated with arduino and things yeah. Okay. I've got so many questions, but first up, <laughs> I love how you made it really approachable. Uh, and like I said, I've, I've pulled up a couple of the links you were talking about. I didn't know that there was this circuit playground, uh, a whole separate show. This yeah. is so cute. I feel like I see snippets of this on like Instagram or whatever, but yeah, the one minute. Yeah. We try to make these um, one minute cuts and share them um, on the various channels just because we think like uh, it's a little bit more digestible and maybe folks don't know about it. So I think we try to do it every Saturday to go with like the whole theme of like Saturday morning cartoons right. back ah. in the day. So that's kind of why we do it on Saturdays. But yeah, these are kind of the legacy puppet show. Um, it's been really difficult to, to like bring this back up, but I think the, the core ones are, are really popular back in its heyday. Yeah. 
Nice. And uh, the tutorial itself is, of course, up on Adafruit. One thing that I love about it, actually, in the code, I saw that you have a sleep mode. And that's something that I always want in situations kind of like this. No shade. I'm not telling you to turn it off. But I have noticed no. that when I'm doing videos, I tend to turn the my robots off just because they make a lot of noise with their servos and stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it it kind of came, the feature came about basically for that reason is like uh how do i turn this off while the head is moving randomly yeah and because of the accelerometers built in it's like that's a great way to kind of use that and, and write for that feature yeah and uh where he was designing it to adabot really feels alive and um you know randomly moving his head which um aj has talked about a lot giving a uh, personality to robots mm. um then uh I was, when I was writing the code, um, I was getting like readings from the accelerometers. He like, when you could definitely tell it was in this orientation. And so then when it goes, when the accelerometer reads that it's there, um, the LED animation changes and the movement completely stops and the audio files also won't play. But then when you stand him back up, he starts right back up <sighs> and then back to sleep. That's so convenient. Yeah. Ugh. It makes me you want, want to, to do that exact thing with mine. <laughs> do you want to talk about the LED animation library? And right, yeah. To kind of write for it. So uh, there's also the LED animation library in CircuitPython. And basically, there's kind of these um, very popular like animations that folks would normally want to do, whether it's like the kind of a fade thing or it's kind of a Larson scanner style thing. Um, and it's non-blocking, which often when you're doing NeoPixel stuff, like that can become kind of an issue. Um, so with the LED animations, like I can just have these different animations queued up and then in different modes have different animations play or, and easily change the color too, um, which otherwise can get a little tricky. So that's another aspect that's on here. Cause in here behind the mouth is just a NeoPixel uh, stick. Um, and then did you have filament, um, to kind of block the light yeah, on his face? Yeah, that yeah. was a kind of a, a thing because I, the originally I made like the, the dark version and that wasn't an issue. So I had to create a separate 3D Ooh. printed um, mask, if you will, mm. uh, that just gets press fitted behind the part because the, the filament, it just, the whole head lights up. Yeah. So I right. needed to just block out the mouth. So I added that little extra part. Yeah. Ah. So that's a nice way to then not have to worry about like shaping your strip or anything. Right. It's just the, yeah. the, I think it's the eight by one stick yeah. mm -hmm. PCB, then, which yep. then can just mount in and, yeah, because it has the mounting hole. It's nice yeah. and rigid. It's a really good solution for something like this. Yeah. So it worked out really well. Yeah, I've got some of these that I keep meaning to use in robots. And, you know, like you were mentioning, sometimes it's a little bit challenging to think about it going into sort of an organic form or like a, a creature form because it is a stick. But you've got it like in this mm -hmm. in this curvy mouth thing. And it looks totally cute. And like you were mentioning, I think, uh, yeah, blocking off the rest of the head so that it doesn't just still look like a stick. Yeah. <laughs> it really helps. Yeah. And that's also something we've done with uh, displays too. If you want them to look round, you can kind of make this mounting thing so mm -hmm. that you have a square, but it's circular. So then in the final thing, it looks like it's a circle, but it's not actually a circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a little tip there. <laughs> Is there like a, a hidden pun in how you put the button on the butt? Why do you think of that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. That's just my brain. That's fun. Um, <laughs> No, it's I. I thought to put it in the head, but because the head's going to be moving, it, you know, it wouldn't make too much sense. Yeah, it might strip the motor. Mm. Um, but that's funny. The design it, it was a little bit challenging for me in Fusion three hundred and sixty. Um, uh, I could show you uh, if you'd like oh, yeah. um what I kind of learned um to to kind of simulate the way the head would move. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Let's see if I can do the entire screen. So if you want to bring that in, we'll go into tunnel mode for a little bit. Yeah. But here we go. <laughs> so designing the parts was, uh, it, you know, it's kind of straightforward uh, for me. But the hard part was um, creating, let's kind of look at the electronics. Uh, it's something called um, mm. motion linking. So you can like, you can create joints to simulate like something moving like his arms. But to link two of those together was something I haven't done yet. So if we if we can take a look at, um, let me see if I can. It's been a, it's been a second since I've been here. So let's see if I can. So I'm in the head. Let's go in the torso. Yeah, having your stuff organized is so is so critical too. Like mm. having the head and then all the things that are in the head. Um, so let's go to the gear for example. So here's the gear, and 
you can kind of make out the servo, right? It's right here. It's kind of like the heart. And if I start moving the head, you'll notice that the gear in the head is also going along with the gear in the servo. So that's using something called motion link. And that just allows me to link multiple joints together so I can make sure that the, ta um, the taunches are nice and that not all the clearances are OK. Uh, so maybe if I do the electron, you can see a little bit better there. And I just kind of move that. You can see kind of the servo horn will like kind of escape out of the body. But I ended up cutting it off just to kind of <laughs> reduce that from happening. So this was like a, a, a fun feature that I've never had to use before. And like going forward, I'm going to definitely be using it for uh, for something that needs to move. Like two things are, are, are working in, in conjunction with each other. This is gorgeous. Yay. Also, uh, another, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to just ask about the parts there, the Adafruit parts. I, I, are those things that are just generally available on your GitHub or something that people can it, get? For yes, people? I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, so um, since uh, Lamar Freed uses um, EagleCAD, I'm able to generate a lot of the PCBs uh, like with one button. Mm -hmm. And then um, it, it'll generate the PCB in the silk, mat, uh, the silk screen. Uh, but then like some of the components like... Uh, the screw block terminals and the chips themselves. I normally just go to digikey.com, download a step file, and then bring it into uh, that PCB. And then just like, it kind of already knows where the placement is supposed to be. And uh, yeah, I'm able to just map it like that. So like the USB connector is there, the JST cable, the stomach UT cable. I just kind of opened uh, Adabot up so I can kind of get a better look here. So you can see here in the neck, that's where all the kind of wires for the NeoPixel, the speaker and the slide switch kind of pass through. And some folks are like, oh, why didn't you use a, um, a slip ring? Because a slip ring is one of those things that you would use for something like this. But because it's right. so simple and because I'm, I'm only getting like 180 degrees of movement, it really wasn't necessary. So I was just like, yeah, I don't need that. Um, but yeah. Definitely more definitely something different. you need if like your thing is continuously rotating and might exactly. go like around and around, and around. Exactly. Yeah. Like if if we had a poltergeist ate a bot here, <laughs> it just kept spinning around and around. Maybe for Halloween. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> Then you'll have to deal with it. You'll have to reckon with the slip rings. Yeah, that's a creepy looking <laughs> new torso Ada butt. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun using uh, joints in, in Fusion just to make things move in the way that they you expect them to. Now, I don't know if either of you is uh, into the whole PCB uh, Eagle thing, but uh, I heard there was a recent announcement that they might be ending support. Is that, am I off base on that? Do you know anything about that? No, you're, you're right about that. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I think like there's a couple of years. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. But uh, uh, I, I kind of learned Eagle um, and having it in Fusion 360 is, Yeah. It, I have mixed feelings about it. Like. Hmm. It's nice. At one hand, it's nice to have everything in one place. But on the other hand, it's like I can feel the bloat because <laughs> like it, sometimes yeah. it's slow. Um, but it, it is what it is. Um, yeah. Do you have any? Um, comments? Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've always used Eagle and Fusion, but um, I've always been curious about using KeyCAD. So it, maybe yeah. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think. KeyCAD has like, you can export you can, like, a step yeah. file. And as long as you can export a step file, I feel comfortable bringing anything in yeah. uh, into Fusion because uh, most sol solid modeling packages, uh, and there's open source stuff like um, FreeCAD supports step models. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time I'll test my step files in FreeCAD to make sure that the PCB that I'm exporting from Fusion is okay. So that's that's one thing that I, I like to do. I like to make sure that my files are accessible. So Adabot, itself is a step file so you can bring that into free cat or yeah. solidworks or any of those other apps do you want to show um the repository oh yeah sure um yeah i've got the cad parts for repo pulled up oh, here. oh right. yeah you saved, you saved me there <laughs> no probs yeah, yeah so uh you can just go uh grab these off of the github mm -hmm. we'll put this link in the description of this video look how much stuff there is because so adafruit has stuff. a billion products that are super custom and oh so cool yeah normally i started off with just like the parts that i had on hand um and then just recently i've been um accepting uh part requests mm -hmm. so if you yeah. have a part that you'd like 3d modeled um you can use the issues tab and just add a, a part request i only yeah. ask that you do one at a time because sometimes people like to batch them and i'm like oh man it's gonna take me like maybe a day 
And yeah. then uh, as me and uh, Katni, our coworker, um, work on the new product guides, we'll submit issues to the repositories and Nay knows what new products are in and knows what the, the PCB files are up so then he can generate the model. And so it's all kind of this coordinated thing to make sure all the files are ready once a new product comes out. Awesome. And also, if uh, folks want to generate their own, I put together a quick uh, mm -hmm. a learn guide on how to use uh, Fusion 360 to convert your own file. So if folks want to do that, they, they're, they're free to do so. There's still a free version of Eagle, and there's still a free version of Fusion. And I think it's still a, a thing that you can do. Yeah, it is. OK, cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I will have to dig through your tutorials to look for that. So uh, just to show, we've got both of your um, uh, Adafruit Learn Guide profiles up on here, and we'll put these in the description as well. Uh, so much interesting stuff. You've also both been on uh, Hackster Cafe before. We had Liz on last year, and uh, Noah, you and Pedro mm -hmm. on a couple of years ago. And you've been up to lots of cool stuff since then. So I wanted to make sure that we get a chance to highlight a couple of other things that you've done, um, especially because you've both been doing, you've both done some air quality products, projects, which is interesting. Um, there's a wearable one. Yes. You yeah. And uh, it's funny. Like, you all, sorry. What, what, no, that's good. Um, we, we don't really collaborate on those projects. Like yeah. Really code or me or Pedro will, um, design a case for it and yeah. just kind of meet in the middle there. Yeah. And that's actually how we met too, is um, we were collaborating on um, the first project was a slider. Yeah. The camera slider. Yeah. Um, so we tend to, I'll tend to do the code and he'll tend to do the CAD design. And then um, we'll usually kind of collaborate on the electronics. Uh, so it's really like a kind of hive mind approach. Uh, I'm definitely interested in your approach for that because uh, so right now you're in the same place. Do you often get together? Is this the one you're talking about? By the way, uh, no, um, I think that was the, a, oh, the a Bluetooth one. one. Yeah, oh. yeah, we have quite a few of them. Actually. So much history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really incredible how much stuff you all have gotten up to. But yeah, so uh, do you both live in Boston? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we uh we live together here. Uh so that's made collaborating a lot easier. Uh that wasn't possible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh and uh we're we're both currently uh working with Adafruit. Um cuz when I was last on I was still um I was an AV tech uh so it's been the past year um I started working with Adafruit full time. Um it's nice to be able to, you know, um be living with someone who understands like, you know, the trials and tribulations of making sure like Adabot is working or like that your code is compiling and things. So that's nice. Um, but uh, as far as coming up with projects, like we'll, we'll see new things in the shop and be like, you know, I really want to use that. And then to be able to, you know, kind of bounce ideas off of like how we could make a component work or um, maybe a concept we've always wanted to try. Uh, that's kind of how we start brainstorming from. And then we usually the, parts list and kind of makes itself from that conversation and then we go from there. Amazing. Um, and do you share space when you, or do you each have your own separate workshop or does that work? Um, no, it's uh, basically uh, the space here. Um, we have I a see guitars, on. I see robots, I see all this amazing <laughs> art. It seems like such an amazing nerd layer. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, you know, we try. And we have a rolling table um, that normally like kind of sits here and so it rolls out and then we're able to bring it out so we're able to do all the video and photo things so it's a fully table yeah from ikea um that works really well because it also has shelves so we try yeah. to utilize the space as much as we can yeah um yeah any pro tips there well the rolling table seems like a super uh a great use of space. Yeah. yeah um paper um, background paper background um, um i for me, uh, the biggest thing is making sure your parts are organized. Um, like we, I use um, a lot of like little pencil cases and things, and um, I have a Dymo label maker, and so like everything's labeled, and like we know what drawer things are in. So then we can always put our hands on like what we're looking for, so then we're not always having to like search around for parts. And it also keeps the space like organized and things too. So that's mm. that's probably the biggest thing. <laughs> Yeah. For collaborating, how do you keep your sort of files and things organized? Do you have, because uh, I always want to collaborate more, but I'm also kind of intimidated by the whole idea of like, how do you share stuff between each other? And, you know, like you're talking about, you often have a, a good sort of division uh, mm -hmm. of between some people, somebody does the modeling, somebody does the code, uh, and then also you kind of both 
can do both of those things. Um, but yeah, how do you uh, share files and organize stuff that way? Are there any uh, hacks or tri tips that you have there? Um, I think we tend to do it kind of organically. And then there's like internal tools that Adafruit uses that we'll use there. Yeah, um, that's a, good point. a lot of like Google Drive kind of things. Um, well, uh, what is it, Basecamp? We, yes, we use yeah. Basecamp a lot at Adafruit. And so I'll give Liz STLs, she'll give me co you know, Python files. Yeah. So having Basecamp, I think is really nice. If we didn't have Basecamp, I guess just email. Right? Yeah. <laughs> email. I like Pretty to use Dropbox with Pedro, <laughs> like when we do video um, mm -hmm. edits. We have our own Dropbox account. Um, it's a pretty hefty one. I forget how, what the storage is on it, but we like Dropbox. You might not like Dropbox. You're, you're more. Into I'm kind of anti cloud stuff. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, for my own thing, like I do a, a kind of a mix between project guides and product guides. So on my computer, there's a learn guide products folder and a learn guide projects folders. And then I kind of organize it that way. Um, and then mm, there's yeah, separate subfolders that will be like these are. The images, these are the gifts. That are, so that's kind of how I organize that. And just GitHub, right? Yeah, GitHub for something yeah. and, and making sure all the, the all the things that go live with the code are living somewhere else besides your own personal files. Like making sure they're either on GitHub or they're on um, in the learn system. So that's that's a big thing too. So that other people can access it if they need to. Makes sense. That's kind of how I personally got into this was like I was taking notes for myself on how to do projects and then I decided mm -hmm. to turn it into a blog just because like I was writing it down and photoing it anyway I might as well just share it yeah <laughs> and you know I feel like that's maybe something that uh, a lot of us have as kind of an instinct you are very sherry people yeah like when I started a little over five years ago now like when I started my YouTube channel um I actually did start documenting projects on Hackster and then um I kind of went on from there um and but yeah it was the the sharing aspect and wanting to like kind of give back to um services that like i'd used um for looking up stuff to get started um how i got started there yeah and i want to make sure that we show your youtube here i'm just pulling things up oh. yeah so you've got your own <laughs> youtube channel not only it's have you been, appeared on uh, and stuff but yeah it's been dormant for a bit um <laughs> but i do plan to maybe make videos again on that channel but um where i'm able to like make videos um for the projects i'm doing with adafruit and do that full time now um i haven't had as much of an urge to make uh youtube videos on my own channel <laughs> mm. and then you also both have uh instagram that people can follow you oh. <laughs> had to switch browsers so we may get <laughs> a little bit of uh specialness here but awesome rich <laughs> <laughs> and then you've also got mastodon and Hexter account. Good stuff. Um, <laughs> let's look at some of your other projects for a second, maybe. Uh, tell us about this, because it includes one of my new favorite oh, things that I haven't yet tried yet. But Okay. Yeah, they're they're pretty fun to play with. They're very flexible. Um, this was more of uh, Pedro's kind of idea. Okay. Um, so he modeled it and he prototyped it too. I just helped out with the video. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's a fun one. There's mm. there's no code really. It's just like a, mm. I think it's a coin cell or a nine volt battery because mm -hmm. there's a lot of noodles that are connected together. Um, and because of the the whole you know release of Tears of the Kingdom, Zelda, Legend of Zelda, mm. it was just the prop that Pedro wanted to make. <laughs> um, so it it was fun for him to uh, to kind of design two different models. He has like the adult version, and then he made one for uh, for his son, my nephew Gavin. And, uh, yeah, he he modeled it, and us, it's printed nice. in the flexible filament, right? Uh, no, it's actually no? printed in like this uh, this silky copper PLA filament, oh, okay. and um, he designed it in Fusion too. Um, I was gonna be yeah, because I've never seen a, a metallic flexible filament. Maybe it exists though. Do y'all know? Um, I I bet you could print it in like a TPU or a Ninja Flex, and then spray paint it in yeah. something. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll work. Maybe it'll crack. I haven't tried it. Um, but yeah, he was he he made the design so that you could like kind of just fit it over like it's big, I guess what would you call it, like a bangle or an yeah. armband sort of thing. So you just kind of fit it on. Mm. Um, so he 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 prototyped that a lot. I remember he printed it maybe a dozen plus times to make sure that the fitting was good. Um, but it, then because it's in Fusion 360, it's parametric. So he made sure that all the diameters of the circles that build it up 
are easily adjustable. So if you want to change those diameters, you can totally do it. Cool. Well, I know that you've both been busy. Would you like to each tell us about a project that you're very excited to have shared recently? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, um, do you want to talk about the lightsaber? <laughs> sure, we can talk about lightsaber. Okay, yeah. so I got over here. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, Realize it's in the back better. here. Yeah. So uh, this is actually um, a suggestion from Lamar. She's like, go ahead and remake the lightsabers because I made a lightsaber when the first uh, prop maker feather wing came out, but you needed a you know you needed the feather M4 or feather M0. Um, so she was like, why don't you redo that one? And with that, I've made a couple of different props since. So one of the things I learned is like you really need to have something that's easily to take apart. So this is the pommel. I can take that out, and under the pommel is the speak or the, the feather so i could i could slide this out and then i have access to the usb port the batteries up inside here don't really need to take it out but the speaker is right there slide switches over here um that turns on <laughs> and another thing lamar thought would be cool is like this is actually um 3d printed in resin from uh jlc pcb and it only cost us 30 dollars to get these parts printed and sent to us uh, wow. So that's pretty awesome. So if folks want to like have a really nice high quality print in resin and maybe they don't want to, you know, deal with the resin themselves because it is a bit of a post process. You can try out somebody like PCB way or JL. So PCB, they both have 3d printing services. Now that are quite affordable and they can ship them to you in a couple of, uh, I think it took like maybe five or six days. Yeah. Depending on what, what day you order it on. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't uh, know I had, they could do that. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 um, they, take STL files, step files, um, and they um, they verify it. Um, there are some limitations, like they don't do any weapons, guns, that sort of stuff. Oh, nice. Uh, but, you know, a, light, a lightsaber is basically a, a flashlight, so that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, at least for now, until someone actually figures it out. And then it probably would, like, help <laughs> the resin. So, yeah. yeah, I just learned about this, actually, from scrolling through you folks' projects and yeah. uh, seeing this tutorial that's specifically about this. I had no clue that PCB way, uh, did you say JLC PCB is the only yeah, one? Yeah, both of them. Uh, so the, Yeah, so they let you do, like, custom colors, and they have this really nice clear resin. Yeah. So you were looking at that Adabot, and that was really cool. And um, what I wanted to do is try out some of the print-in-place designs that like are specifically designed to print on FDM filament machines. Mm. Those came out really good too. So things that have hinges, um, those those are actually they they work pretty well. This one was the Adabot was like supposed to have you know limbs that that are adjustable, mm. um, but I guess because the wall thicknesses were too tight. Uh, it was just a unified body, which still looks super cool. Yeah. But that was one thing that uh, that I wanted to document in that learning guide. Like, hey, if you have something that's really small and has like multiple parts, um, just be aware that they're just going to merge them. Mm. Yeah. Like, yeah. I guess you could print them out. You could submit it like in indivi individual parts. But um, I wanted to see what would happen, you know. And you're, I think I kind of saved some money, but you know, <laughs> it, it all get merged, so the limbs are just unmovable. Well, uh, fortunately, the lightsaber doesn't really have that much in terms of like a moving parts, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's all kind of static. Other than uh, the photons. Yeah. So this was all done in CircuitPython. Um, I asked yeah. Liz to, um, if you if you look at the the camera. Uh, or, uh, that's, yeah, that's okay. Um, we have an RGB LED. So I, I kind of wanted the, the, the blade to match that. And plus, if you hold it down, you go into this kind of light cycle mode so you can change Ooh. the color. So we got Barbie pink here. <laughs> oh, I want to see that mashup now. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Red, yellow, so it turns yellow, green, Yoda green. Is there a character who has a pink lightsaber? I know Mace Windu. Uh, like, uh, oh, he has the purple one. Yeah. Purple. yeah. No, I don't think one. No, there's, like, do you know? I don't think so. Yeah. No. I think it's just Mace Windu as the purple. Yeah. yeah, not yet. I think Mace Windu is the only one that's purple. And yeah. then you got like the Isn't yellow. Isn't that solely because Samuel L. Jackson was like, I want a purple one? I that think is so. Exactly yeah. Yeah. That is exactly like, yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. But in Circuit Python, there's a debounce library that lets you detect long press versus short press. And so mm. that's how we're able to do that because there's just the one button as like input for this. So having to figure out how to have these different modes because we also have short press, we'll turn it on and off. and with that, um, what's handy is uh, there's actually a pin that you control to power the NeoPixels speaker, accelerometer, all the stuff on there. And if um, you turn off that pin, you're saving a bunch of battery power. So if you're taking a prop out 
um, if you disable that pin, then you can keep your battery life a lot longer. So when you press that button, that's what that's doing. And then when you press it again, it comes back on. Um, so that's uh, what's happening there. And then there's a long press to get into that color changing mode. Nice. Um, that seems like it will enable a ton of projects. That's so cool. Um, oh, yeah. So a couple of times we've brought up, uh, I hit this by accident, but I've been thinking about it. Um, in case people don't know, we don't have to go into this like in depth right now because I know it's not necessarily the stuff that you'll specifically specialize in. But just for people who are wondering, it is a fork made by Adafruit of MicroPython that has some special little features that you talked about a little bit, Liz, for uh, using it with music um, and just yes. being able to sort of drag it on like it's a flash drive. But yeah, there and is in recent uh, recently there have been some really good chats about MicroPython, CircuitPython. Um, Lady Ada, PT, and Scott did a really great hack chat. I think it was last week with Hackaday. Um, and then uh, I think also last week on Embedded FM, they had uh, Damian on, who's like the founder of MicroPython. So some really good um, like inside conversations on the two differences and um, what the different languages are working on right now and everything. So if folks want to learn more, I definitely recommend both of those. Ooh. Um, I'll pull up Embedded FM. And the hack chat you said by hack. Yes. Day. Yeah. And awesome. Adafruit did a stream concurrently with the text chat too. So there's like a little extra on there, I think. Too. Oh, nice. Yeah. So we'll put these in the description to the video. It'll just be able to, if you're watching the recording, you can just scroll down. But yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Another thing that you mentioned is sort of design constraints. Um, like, for example, with a, a little differently with the 3D printing uh, from PCBWay. But this is something that you've also addressed in your uh, tutorial for Ada, Adabot. You specifically call out that the parts can all be printed in a pretty small build volume. Uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And I think that's a really cool way to sort of make these things very accessible, like using the standard NeoPixel stick as well, like these things that people are more likely to just sort of have on hand. Uh, and then the having the models be very easy to print on different types of 3D printers. Could you tell us a bit about how else you, um, yeah, how you work within constraints and design considerations and what you take into account? Yeah, sure. Um, normally, I take into account, like, I, I love doing snap fit stuff that don't require any support material. So that's kind of like my, my mm -hmm. thing that I try to make. And a big reason why is because when we document, we have to take it apart like a dozen times. And if I use a lot of glue, then I'll have to either print more parts uh, or pretty much you just got to print more parts, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so by making things snap fit, I don't have to worry about like spending the time using screws to like get a panel to, to stick on there. Um, so I, I try to make it as modular and take a partable as possible. <laughs> so uh, with Adaba, I, I really wanted to be able to take the, um, the back cover off. I wanted to make sure that the, the, head, the head cover could come off and um, try to have everything as friction fit as possible so you don't need any glue. Uh, so a lot of the things are press, either press fit or sometimes we'll use screws if I really need something to, uh, to kind of you know, stay put. Yeah, the thing about taking it apart and putting it back together is, is very real. Liz, you were gonna say? I, and additionally, like when we are making projects for Adafruit, like we want people to be able to replicate it and replicate it easily so that they aren't having to um, seek support or run into problems. So that's another thing. Like you want to almost think about it from the end point. Like, okay, how is someone getting from point A to point B? Like maybe we're fine with like doing a bunch of like weird steps or having like very particular print, but um, we want to make sure that, you know, the average person who wants to just like have fun on a Saturday afternoon putting something together isn't going to like run into a bunch of problems. So that's another um, aspect that we always keep in mind. Yeah, it, I imagine it makes them more upgradable as well. That, like it's yeah. a lot easier to swap out one thing as you're testing it. Yeah, definitely. This is something I'm <laughs> I'm still struggling to learn, you know, this many years on. Um, you mentioned also snap fit. And so for me personally, when I have two parts interface in a 3D model, I try to put like a half millimeter. That's the tolerance that I usually use mm -hmm. for my printer for like on each side, just to make sure that stuff can like fit together. Do you have like a any mental shortcuts like that that you use? Or yeah, you half a millimeter is probably a pretty good rule of thumb. Sometimes I go smaller, like half of a half a millimeter. Is it 0.25 millimeters mm -hmm. is, is a good thing? But it kind of depends on like, uh, I guess your printer, 
like if you uh if you have really good active cooling i think uh, a 0.25 gap between the surfaces is pretty good yeah yeah it probably doesn't help that i always print in like 0.3 millimeters cuz i'm oh yeah impatient <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah. Not this yeah, the layer height is definitely important. I, I tend to stick with 0.2 because I feel like most people are going to do that. But yeah, 0.3, I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> it's probably yeah, a that, happy medium between the like hyper fine, like 0.1, super nice. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, yeah. if you have a nicer printer, you can go like more intense with that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Kevin asks, yeah, so we're kind of getting into this now. But yeah, do you have a tutorial specifically on how to make reliable snap fits? Oh, that's a good <laughs> idea. I, I have a tutorial on snap fit, like enclosures, but reliable snap fits is something I haven't really tackled as terms of a tutorial. Um, I do kind of have something where uh, I kind of avoided the snap fit. Like, for example, on Adabot, um, I wanted to have the PCB have these like clips. They kept breaking. So I ended up just going with screws. And sometimes that just might be the better alternatives just to use screws. Uh, so the uh, the back cover uh, has these standoffs with a, with a simple hole in it. Um, but before it had, um, yeah, you can see the. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. The screws are actually, they don't go all the way through. So you don't really see the screws. Mm -hmm. I guess I could take it apart. Take it apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can put my finger in there. There you go. See if you can prove the can actually yeah, be taken me, apart and put right, it. right. Let's uh, let me change my <laughs> camera real quick. Don't worry about this. Settings, cam. All right, here we go. So I kind of have a little bit of a gap there, so you can see I already started to get it open. And wow, so, not not even a wedge uh, tool or anything. Just no, nah, just my finger. Yeah, because there's enough top, there's enough wiggle room. That point two five um, clearance. So you can see here. I actually ended up thickening them up, but you can see that they're they're a little under extruded there. So in case that breaks off, I wanted to make sure that these screws here will keep it in place. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's a little, fits a little less rattly too. I love yeah, these uh, screw uh, 3D printed screw mechanisms you have attaching the legs and arms. Oh yeah, those are those are those are really nice. Yeah, and I made sure that they were, you know. A little bit loose so that you can kind of um, twist, twist the legs around <laughs> if you want. Um, but I also have a tutorial on how to like use the coil feature in Fusion to create your own custom threads because uh, that tends to be a thing that I, I do. Ooh, I'll have to um, search that up. I love how the texture on the limbs, you know, on the one hand, it reminds me of conduit for piping or whatever that people often use for making robot costumes. But also it the legs are a little bit big bird. <laughs> that's right yeah yeah i guess that's it's it's something more on on uh philip tyrone and bruce yan's design decision to make these kind of these ribbings or whatever these textures to make it uh like yeah big bird or muppety yeah because yeah. <laughs> it is a real puppet too yeah i definitely need to take a page out of your book because i use so much foam tape uh, it is an amazing material, but also like I don't need to be sticking stuff together all the time. It's often just like last minute before I go to like an event or something. Yeah, I actually used uh, magnets on on this. Let me see if I can. Ooh. We're gonna. Sorry, Ada, but we're gonna take you apart a bit. <laughs> but I thought so. They're neodymium magnets, so it might be a little bit difficult to get my finger in there. But there we go. So I have these magnets Ooh. come in here. And I, I, in order to get another thing, like I wanted to be press fit, uh, so they're not glued in there. But then, how do you take the magnet out? So I added a little slot there, so you can like poke that out with the, the needle or something. Brilliant. But this way, um, you know, it'll it'll clamp this, so you can't pull it out. And the same thing with the joint here on that side there. Uh, so I thought that was a kind of a neat mechanism. And and it was kind of a lot of printing, mm. reprinting <laughs> to make sure that like you know, that this stays nice and tight so that you can kind of articulate and pose so it stays in place. So you kind of get a little bit of a gap there. But that's because, like, it's just those magnets are working really hard to keep this clamp down. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I thought that would work really well with these neodymium magnets. I didn't even realize those were two separate parts. It's so oh, nice. Yeah, totally. Yeah. There you go. And then no supports needed because it, because of the part, it just kind of caches itself here. At the top. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other tips for printing things without supports? I often try to like make them hollow on one side so I can just have the opposite side be down. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess the tip would be just split it in half. So I could have printed this 
like that and then added supports down here. But like if you just split it and then you have all this flat area, then you mm -hmm. can just put it flat like that on the bed. Imagine this is the bed. And Are then, you gonna uh, make different little hands with uh, or accessories of other types? I think maybe Halloween we can create something. Give him a costume. One arm data bot already getting there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you've got the I saw in your video of your faces that it looks like that dark version you were talking about is behind you. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. so this was the uh, the original prototype. And, goth um, data bot. A goth bot, huh? yeah. Um, so I'm actually gonna send this to PT soon. Because uh, he, he, I think they would get a kick out of it. Um, but yeah, I thought a black eight about would be pretty cool too. So I started yes. with that. Yeah, black button as well. So I'm also making a sort of goth version of Archimedes. Oh, nice. Nice. That's cool. <laughs> the main thing is like I was trying to make these things with like bits of solar panels that I'm sort of recycling in here because they're so oh, pretty. Wow. They're already broken. I didn't just like mash up some solar panels. <laughs> That's true. Like <gasps> dark RG, dark Archimedes. You know, I gotta, I gotta settle on one, one of the options there. I like the dark immediate. That's nice. Yeah, it's yeah. good play on, on words. <laughs> so, y'all do so much different stuff across different media. Like we looked at all your different social media profiles, uh, and you also make beautiful tutorials. Do you have any uh, tips for um, doing beautiful photographs of what you're doing? Like, for example, this CAD layout up here is just gorgeous. Let me pull this up again. Mm -hmm. You mentioned having a paper backdrop, for example, but yeah, this is often something when on Hexter people are publishing tutorials or trying to teach people how to make a good tutorial that has uh, good photos, good lighting, uh, how to make a, a video that shows everything off as well as text. Uh, any tips there for people who are making tutorials or making videos of their projects? Sure. Um, I guess having a lot of light mm -hmm. is important. So if you have access to a window with sunlight, that's a, that's a nice way to get a lot of natural light. That's like just really nice. Uh, we use uh, these LED panels. Um, I tend to like to point my LED panels up so that the, the, um, the lighting kind of softens up the shadows so you don't get these harsh shadows. Mm. Um, same thing with like a flash. If you have a flash, like point it up so that it bounces off of the ceiling. Hopefully you have a white ceiling <laughs> so that the, yeah. the light kind of comes back down. But that's I guess that's my tip. Do you have yeah. any? Um, as far as like the the paper stuff, um, I like to get the cheap like colored cardstock from like discount stores um, mm. or even the dollar store, and that's like a really cheap, easy way to get um, some really fun color backdrops. And then in that shot that's on there right now, like um, now he has a NeoPixel strip that he'll put behind, just running the standard like rainbow animation, and that gives like fun lighting, and that's really easy to do if you if you're already doing maker projects you know you probably have a neopixel strip hanging around <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah it's actually the lightsaber tube it's a polycarbonate ah! tube with a with a neopixel strip inside of it and that's kind of like my diy rgb light tube that i tend to use for like these pretty shots that have like just a little bit of slow rainbow and there it is yeah is and it facing away or is it like behind the paper or no it's just right there on wow. top of the table yeah 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 I'm amazed that you uh, are able to get anything else to show up in that shot because I feel right, like I have, yeah. maybe you turn the brightness down or something. I mean, that's another thing. Like, um, if you're using a full camera, like playing with the settings, not leaving everything on auto, so that you can really kind of mm. dial in how the light's looking. And also, I'm a big um, proponent of manual focus. You can oh, get yeah. yeah, and not just relying on the auto focus. For sure. Well, yeah. I'm gonna have to toy around with some neopixel <laughs> strips now. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, all of this was shot in our tiny apartment with a, a, a dollar poster board <laughs> and our IKEA table. Like, yeah. Yeah. That looks so good. I'm a big proponent of like making, <laughs> you don't have to have like super expensive stuff to get really nice shots. Yeah. Uh, I like your camera a lot more than mine. And the price mm -hmm. isn't too bad, right? And how much is the body, do you think? Like um, I, th I think it's 500. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. a Panasonic G8. Seven G seven, not GH. Um, so it's like kind of the cheaper Panasonic um, body. Yeah, so it's the mirrorless. Yeah, micro third, micro like, yeah. fourth lens yeah. thing. Yeah, I yeah. use a a Black Magic Pocket Cinema 4K camera. I think maybe the prices are a little bit lower these days, um, but I do have like a a Lumix um, lens. Yeah, but even like smartphones today, like they take such good photos, you don't even 
necessarily need like a full on camera to get nice shots. Um, True. Yep. So it's definitely a lot more accessible. Yeah, I know uh, the iPhone films the the lightsaber and any new. Yeah, sometimes we'll nice. find yeah. projects might look better with um, one of our iPhone photos for like a hero shot or something <laughs> than with our cameras. <laughs> Sweet. So, Noah, last time that you were on the show, you talked about um, this orange peel effect that you were getting by using a fuzzy setting in Fusion. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the fuzzy skin. Yeah. It's so long ago. Um, and I'm curious if you've come up. You, you mentioned using the Fusion locking parts together for movement technique mm -hmm. that uh, that you were uh, working with for the first time. Is there anything else new that you've uh, discovered that you like to uh, work into new projects? Hum. And this is a question for you, Liz, as well, actually. Uh, oh. you, uh, any, any new techniques that you've become enthralled with since we last chatted a year ago? Yeah. Liz mentioned the, uh, there's a new feature in Fusion that just got updated that, uh, that's pretty neat. It's called the emboss feature. And it basically just allows you to wrap um, a pattern around uh, an organic shape model, basically. So yeah. that's that's something I want to play with more because they didn't have that ability before. And to do it previously, it would take like 10 steps. Yeah. And yeah, the emboss feature. So it allows you to wrap like you can import like an SVG file, like a GitHub logo or, or, or some sort of pattern, like a Kumiko pattern, and then wrap it around a sphere or something that you've revolved like a like a cup or a trophy. Or in this case, like I, I have this little uh, this little bird that I modeled in Fusion that uses T splines. <clears throat> Before I wouldn't, I would not be able to wrap text around it. Uh, so now I could put like a little bow tie on it or a little oh. text on it, and that would have been very difficult to do before. Um, this is actually a little IoT project. There it is, the yeah. Canary Nightlight mm -hmm. project. Yeah, this was actually a Katni Grambor's um, idea. She wanted it to do like a nightlight. Uh -huh. uh, what's the song? It's from There Might Be Giants. I forget the name of the song. I'm not but, familiar with the song, but yeah. um, it seems to be popular if you're into They Might Be Giants. <laughs> yeah, so that's a feature I want to play with, the yeah. Emboss update to Fusion. Oh, my gosh. How many years ago was it? Uh, almost 10 years ago, like nine years ago, I was at uh, the Pier 9 uh, artist residency, and I wanted to make like a class ring for the Pier 9 group. Mm. And uh, I was trying to figure out this thing, this exact thing yeah. uh, of like yeah. how do you wrap text around like a ring or something to make a like a cool little class ring kind of situation. And you can do horrible stuff with offset planes and, and extruding, yes. but like exactly offset planes. I yeah. can't believe that this just it's a thing now. I also yeah. totally it took isn't. nine years, but yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Mm, let's see. Uh, let's talk about air quality. You mentioned that you accidentally both built air quality projects. Is that right? Um, we've just, we've collaborated on a few. I think with um, the pandemic, uh, air quality started becoming more in the front of people's minds. And then also with the air quality this summer with the wildfires, um, unfortunately. Mm. Um, uh, but it does make for interesting uh, projects. Uh, one that we I did recently was uh, IKEA makes this kind of um, affordable air quality monitor um, and it's really simple. It uses a PM 2.5 and it's over UART. And so I was wondering if I could put a cutie pie in there since it's so small and then make it so that you could log the data. Um, and I was able to. Uh, so I was able to just connect to the PCB that's inside the monitor, um, connected to the UART pin on the cutie pie, and then um, figure out what the what the bits were basically yeah. looking at some Arduino libraries and then I'm um, doing some testing and uh, publish that. I love this silicone covered wire by the yes. way, the fruit cells. It's so good. Yeah. That's my go-to for um, any like intense wiring. Uh, Cause what's nice is it, it get, has a little, it's a little forgiving. So if you're having to kind of squish it around or move around a lot, it's not going to break. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like the fact that it won't melt. That too. Yeah. <laughs> like, a lot of the PVC coated stuff like just melts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, where was going with this? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Air quality. Had a little uh, brain blank situation there. Uh, had to go with. Oh yes. So, uh, like you mentioned, the prop maker feather is sort of a, a mashup of two previous things. We've got the RP twenty forty feather and also the prop maker. Oh, feather wing. Mm. Uh, yep. As far as I can tell. Um, and so you've done both done a number of projects with the RP twenty forty and the Pi Pico, I believe. Uh, so this um, 
this air quality one is using the ESP32 S3. Yes. I'm curious, have you had experience with, with different versions of the ESP32? Because there's like the S, the S3, the C3. Uh, yes. Yeah. And, and how has that been for you? Um, I've done a lot of projects with the S2 and S3 boards. Um, and what what's nice about that variant is it has the native USB. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier for prototyping. Um, and then you recently did the, was it the ESP32 and the Epcot ball? Yeah. Um, so that one is the ESP32, I guess, regular? Just vanilla. Vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm using the WLED firmware. Uh, from Air Cookie on mm -hmm. GitHub. Yeah, oh. that one there. Um, and that's just like, it's crazy. You, you plug it in. It uses, I think, web serial to flash uh, any EST, ESP32 board. And it, it just has this really robust like set of animations. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very nice to work with. Um, there's basically no code required. You just flash the firmware and you do everything through the... Uh, through the web UI. So it kind of creates a, a web server on that uh, whatever ESP32 board. Oh my gosh, look at it. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fantastic. Best Definitely check out uh, WLED. Absolutely um, will. This is so it, cool. It even supports the ESP8266, the kind of legacy 80, uh, ESP mm -hmm. board. So that's really yeah. nice too. Um, I think they're working on trying to implement the S2 and S3 and C3 and all those variants as well. But for right now, uh, the the vanilla ESP32 and the 8266 are like, they work really well with WLED. So if you just want something that has like a crap ton of LED animations and no programming, that's a good way to kind of go if you're doing a, an arts installation or something. Yeah. And then uh, with the S2 and S3 variants, there's a few different boards that Avery makes on my favorite is there's a Feather TFT. There's one that's like front mounted, and then there's one that's back mounted um, that makes it so that you can kind of mount it on a mounting plate and it has buttons on the side. Um, and it's just really good for like quick IoT projects because uh, you mainly, usually you just want to be like logging data or getting data and then showing it. So with those, they're really good for prototyping or just kind of putting somewhere. Um, so those are really good boards. Yeah, we Ooh. actually use it uh, to, oh, yeah. as a monitor okay. for our OctoPrint. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, not on right now, but yeah. it's got the... You and can, then, um, mm -hmm. and then uh, I have one that's in an octopus. Enclosure. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for OctoPrint or is that... Yes, a, a... for OctoPrint. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I should have uh, the, the creator of OctoPrint on here sometime. That'd be super cool. Yes. Oh, yes. That would be cool. Gina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she's on Mastodon, which, speaking of which, actually, uh, you are on Mastodon, Liz, uh, and we'll put all your social links on the uh, in the description of this video. But yeah, we're sort of coming to the end of our show, and I want to make sure that we give people, uh, you know, where to follow you and stuff. And I've got a horrible tab situation going on here, <laughs> but just to make sure people know, <laughs> we'll put the links down below. Uh, Blitz City DIY on YouTube, you got Mastodon as well, uh, and then both of you are on Instagram. Yay. Yeah, uh, you're also both on Twitter slash X, which I don't apparently have uh, repulled up here. But you've also got your uh, individual um, Adafruit profiles, mm -hmm. which you can get to from any of those tutorials. You're both tagged on there. You just go to the tutorial and uh, this is uh, well, they'll be both listed under the contributors if it's yes. a shared project. Yeah. Um, so very easy to find. And then, of course, we've got your previous interviews on here, which were super fun. And ah, oh, what a delight to have you both back on the show. Yay. Thanks That's so much for guys. having us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And thanks to everyone for joining as always. Uh, have an awesome rest of your day and hack on. Yeah. Bye, folks. Bye, folks. Yay. Thank you.